Daniels. I'll introduce him. Uh, uh, he is, uh, I got to know him 30 years ago. I started, uh, I was, I was uh, studying clinical psychology. That's about how to change individual behavior and how to change uh, family uh, behavior. I was looking at uh, the videotapes of uh, family therapy sessions and were very effective in changing behavior. I was very impressed by that and I was thinking, how can I use this also in, uh, in changing uh, companies, changing organizational behavior? Organizational behavior is the biggest uh, section of the uh, Academy of Management. And, uh, but uh, how can you change that behavior? And how can you pinpoint that behavior? And that is very well studied in clinical psychology, in families, in individuals. And uh, so that was my idea. I studied also uh, uh, Generalize the knowledge of clinical to industrial psychology. And I was looking for literature about it. And there was uh, some literature in America, and the one name that came up most, uh, most often was that of Obi Daniels. And uh, so, I that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, was, I wanted to know him, I wanted to get into uh, his literature first, then uh, went to America to, uh, to see him. He immediately offered me uh, courses for free because he knows about positive reinforcement <laughs> that's the basics of uh, behavior analysis in Holland we don't know a lot about the science of behavior analysis and that is the science that, uh, on which that family therapy was based on and upon uh, which is improving uh, sport performances whatever behavior you have you can increase that behavior if you want that behavior uh, with behavior analysis it's based on uh, Pavlov, and um, well, uh, finally, uh, uh, I had a presentation in November about how I try to market uh, behavior analysis and, and uh, the application in organizations, organizational behavior management in Holland. And to my surprise, uh, Aubrey said, uh, "Well, you're busy there in Holland. I am curious what you are doing there, and I want to come to Holland." And so I was very. Uh, flattered by that uh, gesture and I thought I must make the best of it and we, he has uh, stayed for the whole week here in Holland uh, the next days we will have uh, all kinds of conferences and uh, seminars uh, for professionals but this day we focus on academia about how can behavior analysis help you in your research and in pinpointing behaviors in improving behaviors in assessing behaviors and this is what we are going to about uh, now, what Aubrey will talk about uh, now with you. And uh, of course, you will give him a personal introduction about himself and how it started. Uh, but I think there will be a lot of questions uh, from you. And uh, so you can have the best uh, out of this meeting for yourself. So this is the great man, Aubrey Daniels. <laughs> applause. start by, uh, I love old sayings, you know, an old saying has more weight than something I just thought of. Right, so if you something I just thought of, you, you might consider it, but I said, here's an old saying, it's past the test of time, so it seems to have more weight. So I love old sayings, but occasionally I can't find an old saying to keep my purpose, so I have to make them. Okay. Now, what I'm going to start with is not one of my old sayings, but it is an old saying uh, that somebody else, uh, I guess, involved from the start. It's this talking is learning, listening is teaching. Now think about that for a minute. Talking is learning, listening is teaching. Now, I want to put that into some context. What you have to understand is that. In order to change behavior, what is the, what is the sole requirement? You've got to have what? You've got to have a behavior, right? Now, if you think about what's going on right now, who's behaving the most? Me or you? I am. I'm, I'm saying things. And uh, as I say things and look at you, you have an impact on what I do, right? If I say something and everybody frowns, I know I'm not going to 
say that again, if I do a little approval, uh, if I uh, find people yawning and looking at their watch or what, then that has an effect on my behavior. So because I'm behaving the most, you have the most opportunity to change my behavior. Now if you think about the educational model, what is it? Who learns the most? The professors and students. Well, it depends on how you conduct your class. But if you think talking is teaching, you need that all together. Now, if I only have an hour, I could talk. Well, I used to have a class that was two weeks long, and I taught by myself. So I could go up for two weeks, I know. So uh, I've got to condense that into a few minutes because I want to give you time for questions or comments. But I don't want to do all the learning. I'd like you to do some learning. But let me just uh, start with something that uh, is probably the most powerful formula in the science. Now, when we talk about the science, uh, if you were a good student uh, in psychology, you learned that psychology is the science of behavior, right? But it's not. You missed that. It's a simple question. You're also influencing our behavior as well. Excuse me? You're also influencing our behavior. It's, it's the well, you, I, you, you well, said. well there's, a, there's an old saying that I didn't make up. It says, tell me now, teach me later. Yeah. <laughs> so to the extent that I say something that you do something with and get a consequence, it changes. Mm -hmm. So I'm basically an antecedent for you to learn something unless I conduct the class in such a way that you do something now that I can read for. Does that make sense? But it, it, it's, a, it, it, it's such a dramatic change in the way we typically try to transfer knowledge that it seems wrong. You know, because that the world is basically telling people what to do. And you see, uh, if that worked, wouldn't it be, it would be a wonderful place? Well, if parenting would be a you know, just uh, nothing, right? You tell the kids, here's what, here's the way, when, when you go to this party, here's what I want you to do. And uh, guess what they do? They behave like you asked them to do. But we know they don't, right? You tell them to go to bed, they go to bed. How many times do I have to tell them? You know, oh, no, no, come to dinner. I mean, there are all these sorts of things. Uh, they don't do what they're told. Because what they do is they learn from the environment that that's okay. Nah, they'll call you again. But you still have, I mean, the, 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 the general agreement here that we should be quiet while we're actually listening. Right, yeah. But then here I am, for example, coming right. with a question. So you're something. only more than the rest of us. No, but I was just yes, are. Yes, you are. <laughs> but I'm just saying that sometimes people do actually extra things without being told what to do. Well, I would, I, I agree with that. And it's basically, uh, because of your history of learning. You know, the, the history of your brain would say that uh, you know, if you if you learn from the way you've been told in the past, then you will learn. And it's not like you're not learning anything. Right? But people are big. I'll tell you, I'll give you a secret. The people that take the most notes learn the most. And in education, we don't teach people to take notes, right? I mean, I didn't learn. I'm, I'm a, a very poor note taker. You know, but you learn the most when you take notes because, in fact, you can then look, read the note again, you can remember to do something that you otherwise would have tried. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good point, but it's not like you read a book and you learn some things, but you don't really learn it. It's only if you uh, become fluent with it that you have it to use in some other application. Uh, but if you review your notes, you're going to learn more than people who don't have them. Because much of the time, a class in the morning will be forgotten by the afternoon. Unless you go back and look at the material, and because of what was said and what you read, you know that you're going to learn Does that make that help? Yeah. But, yeah. But, but anyway, there has to be some action, some action that can receive. Here, here's something I think everybody agrees on that we've learned from our environment, right? What, how do we learn? You know, we learn from our environment. Now, there, there are a lot of implications for education. Because if we learn from our environment, 
and we don't behave. What does that tell us? Where's the problem? It's your environment, right? Now, in the United States, if you look at a, a baby, of course, it's true for the hot one, but a baby is in this thing all the time, right? And many times the parents say, ah, don't do that, leave that alone, ah, no, 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 you know, we constantly say that, right? But they, we, it's hard to stop them from exploring their environment. Then when they get six years old, we take them to school, we sit them at desks, we say, keep your hands and your feet to yourself, and if you have a question, raise your hand. I mean, think about how radically we've changed their learning environment. So, it takes a long time to teach them. It doesn't take a long time to learn them, but it takes a long time to teach them the way they want. Because, in fact, the consequences are not uh, what we want. We don't allow them to do the things that can modify their behavior. Now, let me just give you the most important formula in all of behavior analysis. Now, this is me saying this. Uh, but let me just write this up here. Behavior, this is, uh, let me just go over here. Help me out here. part of the environment. Now, if you take a, if you take a young person uh, with uh, a computer or a tablet and a computer game, how many reinforcers do you think the average child will get from playing a computer game? Well, I've, I've actually done it. I, I did it with in the mid to late 20s, and it turned out to be about 85 a minute. With younger people, I've estimated it's probably between 1 and 200 a minute, depending on how quickly they can do this. Now, if, if a child is playing a computer game, then nothing around them matters, right? Because the rate of reinforcement of the computer is very high. It's very high. Okay. Very high. Notice that this is another 200 minutes. Where else?
else in your world can you buy and reinforce it right that time? So they, this, is, this would be an operational definition of focus, right? So if you want somebody to focus on something, then it requires a lot of reinforcement. You know, I was walking down the hall, and I noticed that uh, Morris is telling me that, uh, that uh, Hollanders, uh, you know, leave their windows open and, you know, people can look in and see what's going on. And, uh, I noticed that some people, as we were walking by, did not, they were looking at some, some other people weren't looking at them. And what did I tell you? That some people get getting more reinforcement when the work does. But it's just that simple. I mean, if, if you, if, if I want you to look at me, look at me, look at me, like we do with our children sometimes, look at me. Then they want to look at everything else, right? But what you want them to do and what they find to do uh, is more interesting. So if you think about this in terms of the environment we create for learning, then how do we arrange that? Now, I go into classrooms in the United States, and they've got, the room is decorated, I mean, beyond uh, what any reasonable person would expect. And so, what does that mean? You see, in other words, if we're going to, if we're going to, if we're trying to get this, and this is high, what does it require here? When I went to college, I remember Dr. Gilpatrick, I remember his name, uh, taught history. And uh, he said this, do you know what a soda jerk is? This is somebody who worked in a drugstore in the United States and they would make sodas, you know, ice cream sodas and things like that. It's called a soda jerk. And so he would introduce the class by saying, going to college is like going to the drugstore and ordering a soda. He said, the soda jerk can fix the very best soda he knows how, but whether you drink it or not is up to you. And then he would start reading the same old notes that he wrote in all four, right? They haven't changed a bit, because history's static, right? And he's telling us that in order for us to learn, we've got to you sit there and absorb his lecture, right? And we're going to know it. Well, see, in that environment, there was more reinforcement for talking to a friend or sending a note to your girlfriend or that kind of thing than there was for paying attention to him, right? So he learned the environment such that there was more here than here. Now, if you think about this formula, it applies to all aspects of life. And you can see how in work, at work, that if you're going to get any reinforcement, it's usually here. It's not here. The work is not intrinsically motivating. And uh, external consequences from the supervisor or your boss or your kind of low level. This is increasing every year. Technology is made it so that the rate of reinforcement that technology provides is much higher than, than social or otherwise. So what I have come to understand in my old age uh, is that blame is out of place in learning. There's no need to blame the performer for behaving naturally in terms of what the environment does, right? what the environment produces. And it's because we, we've maintained the same problems in education today as we had 100 years ago. I've got a hold of my wife's musician, and I've got uh, somebody gave us a bunch of uh, etude magazines, and uh, they were like in the early 1900s, this woman had them. And uh, there's a cartoon in there about the teacher talking to the student about how to learn to play. You know, you've got to practice and, you know, you know, all this kind of stuff that every student of uh, music that learned. You see, but, but I, I studied piano because my mother made me. Now, if the child picks up a guitar and starts plinking away on it, then you've got another opportunity, right? 
got an opportunity to make a positive today. My mother tricked me, and she said one of my older friends was taking piano. So you need to take piano. And of course, I hate it. Now, I, of course, I wish I'd listened to her, but I, in those days, I hate it. Well, because the teacher didn't make it reinforce it. And I've come to understand she was not a good teacher. Because the things I wanted to do didn't fit into the method she was going to use to teach me. So, as you think about this, I, this is called Herrenstein's hyperbola, or the matching law. And basically what it says is that uh, behavior matches the available reinforcement. Now, by the way, you probably don't need to reinforce the other And uh, what we find in business, we, over, over the years, we find that, that the highest rate um, known, let's say we got a rate that goes like this, and we, you know, the, the responding takes one, one uh, second, then you can do six to a minute. And uh, that, uh, if you begin to increase reinforcement for people like that, people across the spectrum, then in there, what we find is they increase. So K increases over time, depending on the amount of reinforcement. But if you think about uh, being in school or being at home or being at <coughs> work, the same thing applies. So if you think about, uh, I've got two grandchildren. You know, I, uh, I married, uh, I was 22 when I got married. Uh, we had children when I uh, was uh, my first daughter, 28, 29. Um, I had two girls. They were late to marry. They didn't marry until they were in their early 40s. Uh, they had children in their mid to late 40s. So I've got grandchildren. My oldest grandchild is in the fourth grade. Uh, my uh, friends have grandchildren in college. <laughs> you know, some of them are actually out. So I'm just now experiencing you know, the early uh, problems of uh, grandchildren. And uh, so I, I can understand you know, how if they come to my house, I have one of my grandsons is allergic to everything. So he's, uh, you know, he can't eat uh, anything. <laughs> well, I don't think it tastes good. And so you can't be a normal grandfather, you know, by buying all this stuff. And see, I, 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 want, I want the grandfather revenge. I want, I want to do to my grandchildren what my children did to me, right? So I want to ruin them so when they go back home, they'll miss their head, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I can't do that. I can't do that. But I realize but I realize if they, if they don't behave at our house, it's not their fault. Because our house, and this is for most grandparents, you know, I mean, you're, you're much more liberal with your children. You can, you, you can tolerate their misbehavior better than the parent who's with them all the time, right? And so you tend to be, you know, more lax and so on. But, but, but I have to understand, I, if I create that environment, then I deserve it. They don't pay attention to me just because I'm not made paying attention to me reinforcing. So I don't look at them and say, you ought to do this, you ought to do that. No. If they were naughty enough, they'd say, well, granddaddy, you reinforced me for that. My, my daughters do that to me. Dad, I'm sorry, but you reinforced me for that. <laughs> you know? Okay, yeah. They'd say, you know, that you reinforcing your eye for the wrong thing. You know that, don't you? I guess so. Or read your book. But see, blame, blame is not blame is not a, a proper concept for behavior. You know, if the environment if the environment generates a certain behavior, then we respond naturally to it. And so if in a classroom there are, if in a classroom there are restrictions in terms of how you behave, you get no reinforcement. You're gonna find a way to get reinforcement. I remember, uh, some of you can't wait for this one. 
We're up in the south of the United States. In the uh, springtime, you know, we raise the winters because we run the air conditioning. And, and uh, toward the, after lunch, there would be a lot of flies. And I remember in chemistry, I had a young teacher, she's a first year teacher. And I found out how to catch a fly with my hand. I could, uh, I could, you know, basically sneak up behind them. <laughs> they can fly, I found out. They can take off the wrong direction. But anyway, I learned how to catch them. And I would catch them, and I would squeeze them in my hand, and I would drop them on the floor. Now, my teacher hated that. <laughs> but she spent more time with me than any other student. What's the name? Tell me not to do that. I just said, well, I was disgusted in that was. And it was a very positive impulse for me. <laughs> I learned no chemistry, <laughs> but I got a lot of attention from the teacher. Steve, you had a comment. Uh, what were your thoughts blaming you? Were well, my daughters blaming me? Of course. <laughs> but they'll do that until they, they I reinforce the plan. Then they'll reinforce it. Yeah. Right. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing I think is important to understand. Behavior is not static. In other words, it's always we talk about the ABC model, right? MC behavior concept. That occurs all the time. There's no way you can change somebody else's behavior without you being affected. So if I want you to behave in a certain way and you do, then that's reinforcing to me. If it's reinforcing to me, it changes my behavior, right? Which one does positive reinforcement do? It accelerates it, increases the rate of behavior. So we're constantly being, being changed. We don't have to say the same even for one day. You know, if you think at the end of the day, you know, all the interactions you had with people, then they change your behavior one way or the other. We don't, make, we don't remain the same. We're constantly being changed. Now, the problem we have with businesses is if, if people are changing every day, that means they're getting reinforcement from somewhere, right? So if it's not designed by man, who's it designed by? Well, God or whoever, you know, but it's, it's being uh, impacted in some way. And so we say, you, you need to understand, you need to control this, because if you don't, people are going to find it, and they're going to find it in ways that are probably not very profitable for the organization, or productive for the organization. And so, if my kids are constantly blaming me for their problems, then what's that say? Then I have to reinforce them for blaming me. Heavy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to understand that, that this is, is attempts to be as scientific as chemistry or biology or history. Now, if you want calculus, we can give it to you. Yes? Um, but how are uh, biology in general reinforcement included? In, or is, is that is that most included? Oh, sure. Well, here's, here's the deal. Um, uh, what is called, and you'll see a lot of this, and I, I can speak to this uh, more, but uh, the idea is that uh, What's inside, I'm, I'm about to publish a book, another book uh, called Pit, Life is a Pit. And I think chapter four is called Motivation is an Outside Job. Now, what I, what I want to say about that is uh, you cannot think positive thoughts of yourself until somebody starts you. In other words, if, if I praise my children for doing something, I said, oh, that's good. They can't say that to themselves unless I've said it to them, right? Or somebody said it to them. So we go outside, inside, not inside, outside. I'm not directing myself, but I'm just. Right, you're being the director. Guided yeah. by that's right. yeah. what I keep saying. And you see, it's like if you want to change your behavior, the best advice I can give you is to change your environment. And see, if you look at, for example, what we have in terms of uh, prisoners, easily incarcerated from crime. The big 
majority of them pre commit a crime the day they get out. The very day they get out. But what do they do? Where do they go? To the same environment that produced the in the first place. So, the way we talk about intrinsically enforcement is that it's reinforcement that does not require the presence of another person. And you see, there's so many people think that when they read about uh, positive reinforcement, that that's the sum and substance of it. No. There are all consequences of positive reinforcement. And there's a time and place for all of us. But, but the fact about it is that um, if, if I understand that my behavior is being controlled, if you will, by the external environment, but I either accept that or I fight it. Well, you know, you can fight it all you want to, but if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. And, uh, you know, the whole idea of, of uh, uh, free will and that kind of thing, I mean, we could talk about that if we had time to go into that. But, but the idea is that you're freest when you have multiple responses, multiple responses for any given situation. Now, I grew, up, I grew up in the South, as I mentioned, in, in Georgia, South Carolina. And there were, like, some of the guys would, uh, if you said something bad about your mom, they're going to fight you. I mean, they're just, the only way they knew to preserve their manhood or whatever is to fight you. Right? And sometimes kill you. Uh, on the other hand, if the guy is this tall and he says something about my mom, I wouldn't fight him. I might make a joke. I might do other things. And so I would end up uh, getting out of that situation, you know, and save my, my life. I even had a, a variety of responses that I learned in terms of how to deal with a particular stimulus in that city. And so I would be freer in the sense we think of freedom. I would be freer under that condition than I would if I'd only learned one way to do things. And we call these people rigid, right? And, and in clinical psychology, I saw a lot of them. Because they only had one way, they only been taught one way to respond to situations. And when they got in the real world, you know, away from their family, they got in trouble. Uh, and I don't know whether that's a satisfactory answer or not, but, but I think that it's not that I deny uh, internal behavior, because I have it just like everybody else. Uh, but I understand where it comes from so that I'm better able, I think, to teach my children values than people don't know that. You know, it's, it's important that I, when, whenever they do something that represents a particular value, that I respond positively to that, rather than rely on the natural consequences that may not reinforce it. And so I can teach them honesty, and I can teach them uh, you know, a, a lot of how they treat people and so on. Because I understand that, and somebody doesn't understand that. Somebody thinks, well, they just don't have it. You see, it's like, it makes a good movie. Let's talk about the, you know, internal this, that, the other. But it's not, it doesn't give you much way. If you have that problem, you come out of it. Um, and I can give you a lot of clinical stories, you know, when I was in clinical work. I it's just a, it's amazing to me. And this is a little off the subject, but uh, the variety of the way people raise children. I mean, it's, when I was in Korea, I was in, I was in the army in Korea after the war, thank goodness. And this friend of mine, John Delaval Huckleberry, and I got married the same day, and we ended up in the same barracks. And did, did you see Wayne's World? They're contemplating the, the universe, you know, one night on, on a hillside, you know, they're like, you know, wondering about everything. And, and so Huckleberry and I did that occasionally. You know, we'd go on the hill uh, outside the barracks, and we'd be sitting there. And I remember one night, Huckleberry said, uh, I want to tell you what he says. We've seen it all, haven't we? And 
comes upon one person can do another. I mean, I, I don't want to go into a lot of what it's not too nice, but, but we've experienced a lot of things. And I said, you ain't wrong. I said, we have, we have seen some stuff. He said, when I get back to state, nothing that one person does to another will ever surprise me. And I said, you're right about that. And then I went into trying to talk about it. And I was surprised every day. Would you believe, let me just, let me just give you a variety. Would you believe a, a 19 year old who is still breastfeeding? Now, you know, psychologists are trying to, uh, hmm, <laughs> uh, uh, You know, when I heard this, you know, it's like, <laughs> and inside, I'm going, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> but it turned out, it turned out that the reason he came was because he was filling him up. And he wanted to move out of the town. So they'd say, who was crazy? Him and the mother. Because the mother had the problem. So here you've got somebody who's been raised that way. So what do you do? What, what, what problems does that present in terms of relationships, you know, that go on and so on? And, and, and so you have to deal with it. And so I've never, I'd say I've never been surprised, but you know, I have been surprised <laughs> all the time. And because it is that we are, we are made in such a way that we can, there's an infinite number of things that we can do in response, ways we can respond. And we have to look at them in terms of our history of reinforcement. You see, and, and in the workplace, everybody has a different history. Nobody has the same history of reinforcement you do. Not even twins. Twins will always tell you who the oldest is, right? And they always talk about how, you know, you treat the baby better than you do me. <laughs> it's the twins. Huh? Because it's a different environment. And I think if you think about the environment as producing reinforcement, now, let me just talk about, you read about operant conditioning. You see that word, operant conditioning, a lot, right? And uh, respondent conditioning. Well, Skinner, B.F. Skinner, discovered, if you will, operant conditioning. And what the word operant means is that our behavior works on the environment, operates on the environment to produce a change. Now, changes that work, or repeated changes that don't or not. It's basically simple. You see, if I go over to the door and I push the knob, the positive reinforcement for doing that is what? The door opens. And that's positive reinforcement, you see. And most people think a positive reinforcement is like this, and I, I get it all the time. Give it a copy. Um, if you think if you think I'm a two-faced SOB, and I'm your boss, right? And I'm like, what's your name? Buddy. Well, I said, how a job, buddy. <laughs> I mean, is that gonna change your behavior is more positive toward me? No. No. Is it gonna change your work? You work harder now because it will please me? See, this is where. Words, do, words are not positive reinforcement. Unless you have a good relationship with somebody. So the relationship is first. And a supervisor has to, as, as with a teacher, anybody who's trying to change behavior, the first thing you have to work on is establishing yourself as a positive reinforcement. So it matters to you what I think. You think the relationship improves? What would what, what, what? Yeah, if you said you could tell part, you did good. If you, you don't you trust me, let's say you, if, you, if you think that I say something to you and then I go say, that lazy son of a gun, to somebody else, right? You know that's happened. Yeah. Okay. And then you're not going to do it. <clears throat> you think I'm just saying that, just so. So you have to trust me. You, you have to have the things that, that would, uh, would qualify as a good relationship. And um, this is happening.
happening more and more, for example, in IT. We see this a lot with managers in IT. They treat, they treat the engineers very poorly because they think that it should, they should get reinforcement on the job. That's what they pay for, you know, you hear this kind of thing. And of course it's not. And eventually they leave, you know, or they have problems getting the work done on occasion. Because there's not a good relationship between the two. So you establish yourself as a positive reinforcer, and then you understand I can say all kinds of things to you, and if you understand what they mean, you know, then it will affect your behavior. Now, this is not politically correct. A lot of what I say is that's not politically correct these days. But let me give you this real example of a paper mill we have and we're working with in South uh, in Alabama. We're walking through this big area, and it's a huge room, and it's basically empty. And I looked at it. We're walking through, I'm walking through with the superintendent. Uh, they had maybe 3,000 employees in this plant, and this is the number three guy. And as we're walking through, all of a sudden he stopped and he pointed his finger. And I looked, and there was a man on the other side of the room. And he had his back to us, and he was working. And this guy starts yelling, confident. Hey, you old redhead, son of a bitch! And I whoa, this guy knows who I am, what I do. I can't believe what I hear. He goes, if you don't get your ass to work, I'm going to fire you! I said, I believe there's plenty of work here. <laughs> we, we don't we have a lot of work to do here. And we walked away, he kind of leaned over and he said, if I don't say that to him, later in the day he's going to come up to me and say, you mad at me or something? See, now I use that as, a, as a, a, a classic example of good, effective, positive reinforcement. He caught him in the act, and he said something meaningful to him. They have a good relationship, right? My friend Crook, who I play golf with, all, if he says, um, good shot, I said, Crook, I went over the green. He said, no, that's what's good. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but he's a good reinforcer. Right? And, and we all are. I mean, all my friends are good, positive reinforcers. <clears throat> I mean, they see you hit a good shot, you know, good, you know, hey, good shot. And you put those people, we talked about this earlier, you put those people at work, it's like God struck them down. Good shot kind of roll off their lips, you know. And what they tell, well, I never see anything good. But see, the problem is, just like in a classroom or a plant, plant there always is something bad. Years ago, I remember some work that was done by uh, Adam Lindsay uh, and uh, some of his colleagues out in the University of Kansas. And what they started having to do was to pay the teacher to notice good things about the students. And it worked. It worked. It didn't work. They had somebody in the back room counting the number of attentive reinforcers. And uh, they actually got the money to do it. And it worked. And see, I don't think it was the money so much as it all of a sudden was the, was the, the focus on what was going on. And they've been trained to look for what? Problem. So when it's a problem, sit down. Get more. You know, you, you, you do those kinds of things. And we're good at that. See, most supervisors at work are good at seeing problems, right? Thanks for a lot of problems that you face. You know, I can see what. You know, as a matter of fact, the word supervisor, I think, in our language, means uh, to overlook. Right? Because the desk usually was on a platform in the old days. So the teacher had, was, sat at a higher level than the students. So I can see the person in the back. Because that's where most of the problems are going to be in the back, right? And in the old days, the supervisor rode on a horse. Because I can see down through the crops and I can see who's working who isn't. And we kept that model to the day. Yes. Um, well, I, I don't have much of experience of working in different uh, working environments. Right. But if I look back, at least for my very uh, short experience, yes. short and very yeah. short. Um, I don't think it 
it's hard for me to resonate it for my own uh, environment. So if yeah. you look at uh, high tech startups, right. uh, academic world, I, 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 I also don't see it happening. That people are saying you have to do it. You know, they're sort of right. like uh, yes. threatening or, or right. raising their voice. Right. So there is a different sort of uh, reinforcement. Yes. Uh, which partly is also because of the drive of the person. I, I would assume. The, the drive of what's... Uh, well, I would say, generally speaking, things are changing, but I'm not sure for the better. Mm. Google has been very successful, right? Yeah. And uh, what they do is they do a lot of positive things for people. Like, if you're going to work late, they will give you a chef's cooked meal. Right? They have a ping pong table. They have foosball. They have you know, all these sorts of things that you can do. Well, they are lucky because there's going to be a price to pay. That's what we call non-contingent reinforcement. That would be a price. I was reading uh, on the web about some of the problems they're having, the two problems they're having, because the, some people now are working long enough to get the chef to cook a meal and leave. <laughs> and so the supervisors are basically saying, that's not fair. <laughs> that's not fair. You know, yeah, I gave you this meal and it was because you're going to be working late and you ate it and then you went off. And so I don't know how to deal with it. So the problem, the problem we run into is that people who try to be positive when it doesn't work, they tend to get more angry, right? No, because, and I've, I've written about this in terms of the <coughs> track, and the basic is that you get more positive reinforcement for punishing than you do for reinforcing. So, uh, I would say that people at Google and some of the Silicon Valley companies, which they all kind of copy each other, yeah. has been that. They try, they want to have a positive workplace. And they think that means giving people what they want. So, what you're saying is the idea they don't create a strong relationship because obviously, if I somehow my supervisor here will come in and tell me, hey, you're not doing your work, um, then I will tell him, what to why I'm leaving, and I may hopefully, I mean, I would hope that I have another option somewhere else. Yeah. Um, or there are other processes that I can go and complain, or we can do all these kind of talks around here and try to also work there. But at the same time, what you're saying is that things like what Google is creating are not necessarily creating these strong relationships. So even it doesn't matter how your boss is talking to you, the fact that it's only about a meal, then that won't, that will not leave you in a place. I think you what happens kind of interesting. When we talk about contingent, what we basically talk about is there's a strong relationship between your behavior and what the consequence you experience, right? And uh, so if something is non-continuing, as this would be, it's not, it's really not, not non-continuing, but it's not contingent on the work you want to do. That eventually it degrades your performance. Now, the reason that Google's able to get away with that is they created a, a great product or service that people want, and they've been very successful. It's getting more and more competitive, and the more competitive it gets, the more they're going to have trouble with it because they give people raises whether they do them well or not because they got a lot of money. But the, the, the point I'm making is that you get more of what you reinforce whether you intend to or not. And so if you, if you re reinforce people who are complaining, what are they going to do? They will come more often. So they should analyze the behavior that they wish for and see what are the reinforcements for that behavior and then apply those. Exactly. So you have to think about it. See, the problem is most of the time we don't think about it when we have a problem. I do with that. And what, what people say is, well, 
Most people are spawning in progress. But that's simply because they selected people with a certain kind of history of reinforcement. But then the thing, so isn't it about the how the missing something that is also about the drive because um, if that if he, if he drives that person was that guy uh, yelled at him or yeah. of course yeah. or uh, he drives someone you know it doesn't matter I'm working in this space because I'm getting uh, chef's meal I'm getting uh, able to do my own things then then there is also something about the drive of what the person is actually looking for and that's in a particular environment. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know, a lot of organizations, I'm working a lot about uh, making employees be more innovative and creative. Um, I think you cannot, you know, it's very hard to say that to someone, uh, just, you know, uh, you cannot tell them be creative. You need to just right. let them right. be creative. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, you have to reinforce them to be. See, the environment has to reinforce creativity. Ten year at uh, Harvard uh, School of Life uh, Management that I've worked at. Okay. And I thought it was a great course on creativity. I said, the most important thing you'll learn today about creativity is creativity behavior. And you can increase or decrease it. So we don't let the person uh, be creative in the sense that everybody may not be creative. What we're going to do is we're going to reinforce creative acts, creative behavior. So it's different as opposed to the same old thing. And so I can manage that. Innovation, creativity, all those kinds of things. As long as I identify what the behaviors, what, what would I want them to see. This is with your children. It's with, it's with children or drawing, and you say, what is that says is true? And, uh, you know, that looks like that's true. And uh, they come back, and, uh, and uh, they keep doing the same thing over and over. Well, I reinforce the stereotype response. I do that. On the other hand, if, uh, if I say, "Oh, I like this one because this is," you did something different here. I like that. That's good. Then guess what? I get one of them next time. I get something that's a little different. And then the father comes and says, "Daddy, look, 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 look." what I've done, and that's a way to teach people how to be more flexible and creative. That's what they do. Uh, on the other hand, uh, many, much of the time in business, we have a process that we want it to be followed. And bearing is not what I want you to do. Now, in things like IT and so on, my, but my experience in IT is that many managers have trouble with IT because they have a history of being creative, that's why they were hired. And then they want to, okay, now you're going to follow this, this process. And when you vary, I'm going to say, wait, did you follow the process? Yeah, it's the whole idea of the waterfall uh, development, right? What? Waterfall development, so uh, contradicting to the agile development, the software. Yeah, right. Right? The, the waterfall, the, it's all sequential. That's right. See, this is where you know, I don't have the answer to every, every problem, but, but if, if you identify to me, here's the behavior I'm trying to get. And we, we get it down to what we call a 10 point behavior. Then all that remains is finding an effective reinforcement for you. Now, you see, there are many managers that don't have what I would call a modern concept of what work should be. So I think in the future, work is going to be done by the, the, most of the work is going to be done by the front line. Most of what's created is going to be done by the front line. And the work supervisor will disappear in favor of person. And the only reason I'm needed is to help you do better. And my, my evaluation is on your performance. I'm going to do away with that story. See, I don't want to sit in judgment. My evaluation is how, how I'm going to help you do that. If you have a problem, I'm going to help you with that, as opposed to uh, criticizing you for what you do. That's the way I'm going to talk about your brain. I'm going to you that. First job, confrontation in the workplace and a factory was common. 
You walk through, just walk through it. You will see somebody standing there that you don't know. Them, but you don't see them. So that doesn't mean the main reinforcement is it's, it's still there. Remember now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, who's the judge uh, of the process you were describing um, that he will help him perform better? Well, you know, obviously we'll have targets. You know, we need to we need to, we have customers that we need to set So in the end, it's about setting up customers. And uh, so you ask yourself, in this way, there's a revolution going on in lots of countries. Look at the very question. What is supposed to be doing? What, what is my job? Yeah. What am I really supposed to be doing? And uh, how would I be that? Well, if I'm a supervisor, then my manager has the accountability of the work. Help me be a coach. Mm -hmm. So my, my boss will have to define what behaviors make a good coach. And then how can I bring out the best in them relative to that. Uh, but you know, if you go, uh, people talk about the need for false equation. And how, why do we need to do this? What is the purpose of this false equation? Well, the best I can see is to help people do better, right? But it never does. I mean, the research shows that you, you do the same thing over and over every year, right? You got the same problems every year. And uh, so my point is that uh, if, in fact, we use supervisor and coach, number one, we can probably expand the number of people that you can manage. If you do a good, good job of coaching, then you don't need to coach. After a point in time, there's not much you need to do, right? So we can reduce the number of supervisors. We can reduce our heads. You know, we can do the other kind of things. Uh, whereas today, you see the problem with negative consequences, implicit or explicit. That, that you will, if I'm using negative reinforcement, then I'm going to have to watch you. That's why a supervisor, I have to see you so I can see if you're doing what you're being made to do. And if we don't have enough of those, which we typically don't, to manage that way, there's an old saying, I'm sure you have it here. Cats away. Mice will follow. <coughs> no, they do. The mice will do what's reinforcing when they're out from under the negative reinforcement control. But if I do things to make you behave, then I've got the staff up to do that. So I've got to be able to watch everybody. Now, computers are helping us do that sometimes, but not to the level we want yet. How does it work in the virtual world? In what? In the, in the digital workplace. Well, it's not working very well. Mm -hmm. It's not. Uh, the, the problem it comes back to what you were talking about a while ago, and that is the creativity that comes from. You know, people don't know what, what is creativity? What, what is the behaviors involved in creativity? What do I manage? Well, what they manage is the person that identified the problem. And uh, you know, lots of times, for example, the person with the with the meal I mentioned, he eats the steak and uh, eats the meal and goes home. Well, what, what the supervisor typically doesn't know is he came in two hours early. Mm -hmm. And you don't know that, you see, because the guy said, well, I can work better when I'm here by myself than I can when everybody's around. And so it's becoming more and more of a problem. See, here's, here's something about, I'm 80 years old, right? Mm -hmm. Every day, I have to go to somebody younger in, in the company for problems I have, particularly technology. I go to Tyler, two, three times a day. Tyler, tell me this. You know, all, all you got to do is, oh, is that simple? But even though I'm 80 years old, and there's a problem with behavior, guess what he does? He goes to me. Because the laws of behavior have changed in all time. They have changed. We still learn from our environment, just like people did a thousand years ago. And uh, so the environment is changing so fast now that companies haven't been able to keep up. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a book by uh, Christensen called The Innovative University. And he's predicting the downfall
young Paul was University. He said Harvard, which has a an endowment of like what two hundred billion dollars, he says they are so big and so encumbered by policies, pre procedures, and so on that they cannot turn the ship around quickly enough to be overtaken by the small one. And he, uh, you know, to go to Harvard probably cost sixty thousand dollars a year. There's a college, it's a, um, a Mormon school that, that was taken, bought by uh, BYU, Brigham Young University, where you get a four year degree for $8,000. What they've done is they have, I know this morning, there are lots of rooms that I walk by are empty. Well, if you go to this college, and you get us an IRO. Uh, they're always full. And if they have two or three people, in a class, well, they don't keep that class together. You know, but they want to make sure that all the classrooms are utilized. You know, so we've got an investment here. They're all utilized, and they they've done a lot of uh, stuff like that. They, every 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 student has to have at least one online course every every semester. But they've done a number of things. They looked at the cost is too much. You know, I was on the board at Furman University where I went to school. And uh, every year, I mean, every year, we'd sit around and talk about how much we're going to increase tuition. I don't think it ever occurred to anybody, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can we not find a better way to do this so we can decrease it? I mean, it's, it's ungodly how much it costs in the United States to go to school. I mean, it's like Furman University, which is a small liberal arts school, is $47,000 a year. I mean, who can afford that? Well, apparently enough to keep it going. But it's coming to a point where, you know, the, the, and you can see the plot line in terms of the uh, subsidizing education, which they have to see. This is something I must say. The model is broken. I mean, it's a wrong model because we haven't subsidized it. If we don't have enough people to give money back to the university, we can't, we can't live. So no student is paying their full amount. Even if, even if they pay the forty-seven thousand dollars, it costs more than forty-seven thousand dollars to teach it. So nobody ever says, "Well, can we do this more efficiently, more effectively?" And I think we got to, or something's going to happen. You know, uh, there was a um, an online course. You know, told, let me see, who was it? Told me. One university taught it on. It was on creativity. Actually. Two people that scored at the top of the, it wasn't class, it was a class, but scored the highest, were hired by Google. Six figures. Neither one of them had, neither one of them had a college degree. So, you know, it, it, the competition is beginning, you know, to curl on all fronts and say, we've got to do something. And I think we've got to do something fast. I think it's not, it's not something that's going to evolve. So, time I was a trustee, nobody could tell me how, what was the advantage of Furman at, uh, you know, like two hundred or more thousand dollars to teach them over a public school where they could go for a half the price. What's the economic advantage? What do they learn? They said, well, we can't, we can't pinpoint exactly what it is we're trying to do. Does it teach their education or institution? It's, 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 a, it's a trouble. And I think it's like like uh, uh, technology. If you look at uh, the rate of technology increasing, I went to Singularity University. Have you heard of uh, Ray Kurzweil, Peter Diamandis? Peter Diamandis wrote a book called Abundance. It was fairly popular. Uh, Kurzweil has not been all that popular because they like this thing. The books like this thing, but uh, they they describe the future. Talk a lot about what's going to happen in the future. Now, Kurzweil has been particularly effective because 92% uh, of all his predictions, and he gives a timeline, he says, by the year of this year, this, these things will happen. And 
92% uh, of the audience, I mean, so 100 and some have passed, and he's been right on 92%. And he wants to argue about the other 8 percent He said, well, they all went down. <laughs> but he's, he's accurate in doing this. And what he's talking about is the rate of change. And Singularity University is basically named for a physical term called singularity, but, but it's basically a deception. Singularity is the point at which uh, computers will outpace humans in terms of the end of the same And he says that will occur in the next 15 years. Now, if you look at the rate of change, there's, there's technology. In other words, uh, it was years ago called Moore's Law. You probably familiar with Moore's Law. Talks about the computer power, and computer power was doubling every two years. Then it was eighteen months. Now it's less than a year. So most of our customers cannot relate to this. But what they're doing is they're setting goals on uh, a, uh, a menu. Let's, if we can improve, if I could go to any customer in Holland or the United States and say, we will guarantee you a 20% improvement in productivity, quality, whatever, for the next five years, compounded, or your money back, how many of you think we would want to sign up? But see, that's on this kind of money. When the world is moving this way. Now, the problem is that change in the beginning is incremental. I remember we were working in uh, an automobile business in, in the United States when the Japanese first started. And I can remember managing to say how much market share they have. And of course it's less than 1%. And so that would bother. So, if you think about this, um, like uh, Google has a, uh, a driverless car, right? But before it's even been made public, two or three other manufacturers are starting the business, right? They're getting in. But if you have a Google car, can you have a Google truck? In the United States, it's very hard to get a driver. Because they have to work weekends, they work away from home and on all the time, and so they have to give them all these benefits and things, and, and they advertise all the time because they people work for them and play. Ten years from now, it won't be in front. There are fewer accidents, things will be delivered on time, you know, all this kind of stuff will be better. Well, you've got to think about, okay, what are you going to do with the people who drive trucks? Are you familiar with Google? Yeah, Google. Who's that going to impact? Well, right now, it's going to impact truck. It's hard to get an impact truck taxi drivers. But see, when you have driverless cars, they'll have one at your door. You want to have a driver? You just get in and you tell it where you want to go, and it'll go take you without a driver. They have a machine that cuts rock uh, to, to mine this product. And uh, it's uh, 700 feet long. I think that's a long piece of wood, right? They have three people. They operate that machine. But you know what? In five years, I was down to in five years, nobody has that. If, if you can sit in a desert in Arizona and hit a target.
target in Afghanistan, 30 meters square, you can operate that piece of equipment. You don't have to spend an hour getting down there, an hour coming back. So all these things are going to impact the way we manage, what we manage, and I think that you know, we can't manage, and we call it precision management, if you can't be precise about what you're trying to do, then you, you stand the risk of being overtaken. And, and education is the thing. When they, you can't find your product. If most people can't make it anymore. What are we really trying to do? But what are the fake, what are the fake creatively? Okay, what is that? How would I see that? How would I know that's happening? Well, doing some kind of brain transfusion or something. But it puts you at risk. It really does put you at risk. And I think that Education on this earth, and it goes on here. We, we have a foundation that started last year. We were what's called 501c3 in our state of We're trying to accelerate uh, education in this area. I grew up in South Carolina. South Carolina has a, a part of the state where it's called. Part of shame. That's not education. Education is so poor that they talk about the lost generation. I mean, it's a, a generation now. They're not the technology. They cannot do technology, and they've given up. On it. And uh, so we're going to try to accelerate the rate of change. You see, if you think about this, what we're talking about is accelerating the rate of change, shaping. I don't know if we talked about that or not, but shaping is on this curve. And what shaping is, is the positive reinforcement of incremental improvement toward a goal. Now, the reason it's on this curve is because positive reinforcement accelerates the rate. And so when I'm looking at what our customers say, well, if you're not accelerating the rate of output, whatever, then you're not doing the job of the reinforcement you need to do. You can get by, not for now. But one day there may be an Uber in your future. Mm -hmm. You know, a driver's car. I'm fascinated by this sort of thing. I've talked about it a long time. But you know, they, they now have the ability. Like if, let's say you have a wound on your hand where you got burned or uh, scarred or what had infected. And let's say it's about the size of a large corner. They can now take a swab in your mouth or whatever and create a patch with your skin, like a bandage, and put it on and, you know, it increases the healing time, I mean, decreases the healing time dramatically with a zero chance of uh, rejection. You know, I mean, so, but, I mean, this is the kind of future we're in. I mean, they, they, can, they can make... They can print, get this, I know I want to, they can print a kidney. The biggest problem in medicine in the United States is the waiting list for kidneys. They can print one now that creates urine. Okay. And what Kurzweil says is that in 15 years, if you can live 15 more years, then you can live as long as you want to. Because most, most diseases, will be conquered in 15 years. And uh, we can retrofit you, <laughs> you know, with a kidney, with a heart. They can print a heart. They can print a heart. I'm talking about a printer. <laughs> I mean, it's just fascinating. But if you live long enough, you're going to have to be on this curve. This is, this is just going to be But see, my point, when I went to Central University, to see what they knew, they, they know so much about technology, but guess what, know what they know? Almost nothing. Almost nothing. And many of these companies run into trouble. <coughs> after they get going, right? They have a product that's really revolutionary, and so they, they get income and they get sales and so on, but sustaining it's really hard. And many times, like we do, their payroll of what they spend on people is way higher than they can support indefinitely. And, uh, so it 
make a damn thing bad, it just uh, occurred in terms of what the current conservatives live in. Then they have other problems. And so that's why we think that the, the, the between behavior now and opinion, and people don't understand behavior, they don't do it. This is my position. I mean, I'm saying, but that is my position. That those who understand behavior are never going to run out of something to do. Those that understand the thing that motivation is an internal thing you do by yourself and so on, you know, we, we know how to change behavior. And we have a hard time sometimes getting the organization to do the kinds of things we know that will make the organization better. Do we still have an answer for you that we hire you to do a job and we're going to pay you well and give you benefits? That should be the end of it. And they're not going to they don't make it. But they'll, they'll be around for a while. Yes? So what about extinct, uh, extinction? Because all these kind of reinforcements are often also things that are extinct after a certain, after a certain amount of time. They will just don't do their job right. as well, they did in the beginning. Yeah, so no, that, that will be a problem. You're right. You're right. Yeah, because then you have to adapt every time, and every single employee will be different in what they need for reinforcements. Whereas a manager can imagine it's a huge job in order to reinforce everyone individually in addition to that? No, we need two problems. First of all, and this is something that you have to get their head around. That your reinforcement and his are different. Mm -hmm. And if I don't know that, and I try to give him something that you would like, but he got it as a result of some good work you did, then you know, that's not going to work. So it's got to be much more individualized. And that, as a coach, you've got to be able to respond to the differences in uh, uh, reinforcement. Um, now the other is that that eventually, uh, if, if we've got a company on this curve, they're producing a product <coughs> that is too expensive or too old-fashioned or what, then the need for that goes away, and so those behaviors undergo extension. Now, if you study schedules of reinforcement, what you'll see is that the danger of our own behavior is that once we have a strong habit, it takes very little reinforcement to keep it going. And so what's going to happen is that I'm afraid many of these, in, not just companies, but industries, will continue on this path until they die. And somebody will take it. Uh, at Singularity, uh, 72 people in this class, I was in this executive class, which is like seven or eight days. And uh, uh, 70, 72 people, and 68%, I think it was, was not side by side. So the problem with that is that the people from outside the United States, many of them are from the developing countries, can go back, and the day they get back, they can start. A new, a new product, new service. In the United States, it takes a couple of years. They were telling me that um, an FBI, the man from the FBI, gave a little talk, and he said that if you've discovered that there is a terrorist, a suspected terrorist in France, that you would like to interview, if you follow the route. By the time you move, move up your chain of command and go over and move down their chain of command, it's three years. You see, here's the problem with education. At the University of Georgia, there was a biology major, not a person, but a, a major, that they had students in there getting ready to do their third year, and they all of a sudden realized technology had passed them. So I talked about what are you going to do the last two years with these people? I mean, they started out with this major and now it's gone? Well, see, four years is a long time technology wise. And so this is why we've got to accelerate the rates of learning, the rates of changing behavior, and that kind of thing. The people who do that well are going to be the ones that learn. Uh, and if we've got to be able to avoid extinction, then we know that there's, there's, there's 
no reinforcement that the baby will eventually sink. Yeah, but also the other way around, like uh, also reinforcer, right? Will kind of strike will diminish, right? I mean, uh, salary can be a reinforcement in the in the first place, but then after a certain amount of time, time it doesn't do much to be reinforced. Yeah. So how do you keep up with that? Well, I, I think what we're going to have to use is a combination of, of interpersonal and technology. You see, for a scientist, the biggest reinforcement is discovery. I mean, you get excited about, whoa, it worked. And, and so you don't have to wait until um, uh, you, you put a product out in the market and have it fail. I mean, you, 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 they excited every day about some little change that they see, and they want to do it again and again. You know, do it over. See if it works again and again. Uh, so if you, if, you, uh, if, you, if you have a stable product, that you're looking at all the time, and it's not, you're not able to find a way to see the longer you wait to figure this gap, then eventually reinforcement is going to stop. I mean, the, the natural reinforcement of sales and dollars and that kind of thing will stop. Mm -hmm. And the behaviors that people engage in in trying to uh, bridge that gap won't work. And so eventually they will sink. The problem is that some people are on a thin schedule of reinforcement. They, they, they keep doing it for a long time. They just think, well, this is going to work. Just like many of the old miners who end up poor, you know, because they've been in the mine with no gold. But they've been on an infinite schedule, so, you know, they, they think, well, maybe this, maybe this time I'll get it. And then it doesn't work, well, maybe this time I'll get it. Because their history is, They've been dry spells before, you know, where they didn't find any, and then all of a sudden they found some, and, and that's, that's the most, uh, it's, it's dangerous in a way, because it, it keeps you on the wrong path. Now, shaping, of course, is, is the technology for changing paths, where we, we're able to see small changes and reinforce them. And people are not typically good at this. You know, I find men are worse than men than women are. Now, this is a sexist statement, but so be it. But I think it's because women pay more attention. Women, the job of women in our society and cultures, from them to men is small. It's just like a guy was telling us kind of a joke. He said, uh, when I got married, he said, uh, I sat my wife down and said, Look, now, uh, you're going to handle all the small business, I'm going to handle all the large Get that? That's the way it went on. Huh? So, well, how's that make itself? That's why they have many large problems. <laughs> you know? They're always small problems. You know, like, where we're going to live, you know, what we're going to eat, you know, all that kind of thing. You take care of it. How the ways it's your own? You get Now, war and peace and stuff like that, I'll take care of it. And I think that. The ability to be able to take behavior that is different from what we want and get it under some of the value is skill. It's called shaping. That is, you're going to reinforce small changes. And women, because, you know, it's like, I think men have a disadvantage because they don't look in the mirror very much. Seems like my wife would be looking in the mirror and she's you know, they're doing this kind of stuff. And what I've what I understood, I said, man, I've been married 50 some years, I mean, a long time, same one. And sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. But right now, uh, that uh, she has the ability to see things in people that I can't see. And I had a business partner years ago. And she saw him for what he was and what his reinforcement was before I had. It's like my wife will walk in at one of our neighbors' house. You know, it's like we haven't had that for a while. And she'll say, Oh, where'd you get that? I said, I really like that. I think she's making it up. I, I should know better right now. Kate, I remember she said, Oh, I got that yesterday. And she noticed, I didn't notice that. 
I mean, I've been in the house many times. I didn't notice the change. But she noticed it. And see, that, that, that skill was important in shaping. Not to be able to see the difference in furniture, but to be able to see small changes in behavior. And I think that men have to work at something that women grow up paying attention to. And uh, so that makes them uh, able to change behavior faster. I think that kind of is probably that. But see, you're really fussy me. I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm under your control. Well, thank you for coming. I enjoy talking. Even though you didn't learn anything, I talked <laughs>